Thank you guys for coming. My name is Lisa Gates and I'm the director of the Office of Financial Empowerment. And we are located in City Hall, room 220. Uh, to tell you a little bit about ourselves, um, <clears throat> we have been um, in City Hall for about four years now. And we have several programs in our office. We have the um, college kids program. So when you fill out your um, survey, there's a section in the back. If you have a child, a grandchild, a niece or nephew in the St. Louis Public School District or charter school um, in kindergarten, first, second, or third grade, um, if you'll put their name down in the school, that child will automatically receive an incentive for your um, attending this class this evening. So, um, also we have the Operation Hope program, which is a nonprofit or nonprofit organization that does um, financial counseling. Um, so they will help you budget and save, pull your credit report, go over that with you, and um, that is available. Um, now, um, we want to welcome Andrew Hall this evening, who will be doing a presentation on estate planning. Um, Andrew has been with our office for, or doing, partnering with our office for many years. Yeah, three or four and, years now. Uh, he does presentations nationally now. So he's a great presenter and in great demand. So. I am going to turn it over to Andrew and right. let him get started. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, thank you, Lisa. Like she said, I uh, go around the country. I help nonprofit uh, educate folks all about all different types of financial topics. So whether it's uh, come on in, <laughs> um, come on in, the more the merrier. Find a seat. So uh, the you know, on, on various different topics, whether it's being from the very basic of uh, basic financial planning, budgeting, getting out of debt, credit building, et cetera, to more complex estate planning, taxes, um, all those different things. I know enough to be dangerous in all of them, and uh, I educate them. On my personal background, I'm a CPA, uh, and so tax and estate planning is kind of my forte. It's what I, I like to do, oddly enough, um, and I'm here tonight to, to teach you. So please feel free to ask questions. It's, you know, I'm here for you guys. Uh, I don't want to just sit up here and just talk, talk to you. So if you have questions or concerns or anything you want to go over, by all means, let me know. If, um, come on in. I just had a question. What's Do you up? Need a, will you have a slide first? Nope, I'm oh. good. Okay. Um, so if you have questions or anything like that, by all means, let me know. If you don't feel like asking in front of the class, you can always ask me offline. Uh, my door is always open. You can say, we're here to help you. Uh, we're, we're a nonprofit organization. So uh, with that being said, uh, I'm just going to kind of dive right into the material. Uh, be respectful of your time. Get you out of here at a decent hour. Okay. So uh, estate planning, kind of estate planning 101 is where, where we'll start off. We'll talk about, a lot about wills and trusts and all types of, of other stuff and, and taxes, okay? What do you guys think of when you think estate planning? Um, estate planning, like your personal belongings, like your house, your businesses. Right, house, uh, business, cars, estate. Right, so yeah, that's, that's a good point. That actually answers that question. What is your estate is basically every single thing that you own, whether it's a car, boat, home, business, money, IRAs, 401ks, 457s, whatever it is. It's every single thing that you own. And um, when I think about the estate planning itself, when I think about the plan, it's not just how do I pass my money on to the next generation, okay? It's, it's really how do I keep what I have by way of not paying taxes and fees or anything like that on any, un any unnecessary expenses that I have, but also how do I uh, pass that money on to the next generation as efficiently as possible? Not going through probate courts if I don't have to, not paying excess lawyer fees if I don't have to, uh, not paying excess taxes. We'll talk a lot about that if I don't have to, okay? Um, that's kind of what I think about when I think about uh, estate planning. Anything else? 
How to avoid estate taxes. How to avoid estate taxes. We'll talk about that. Usually the first thing I get when I think about estate planning is wills and trusts, right? What is a will? What is a trust? And we'll talk about that. And all those are just tools. Okay, the plan itself is is what you really need to worry about is what is your actual plan? What is your strategy? Once you've developed a plan and a strategy, the tools that can come along, wills, trusts, etc., are just that. Those are just tools, right? But we got to use the right tool for the job. So I guess the first and foremost, the question right there, what happens if I die without a will? What happens? Uh, I believe it ends up in probate court. It ends up in probate court. Yep, that is uh, partially correct. Bonus points. Does anybody know what that's called when you die without a will? It's called dying intestate. Yeah. Yep. So basically, uh, basically, if you don't, if you die without a will, the the state of Missouri or wherever has a will made for you, um, essentially, right? There's this thing called probate court, and all probate court is. If you flip to the next page, there, all probate court really is is a uh, a court. It's a public court which says uh, Andrew Hall or whomever has died and his estate is open to the probate court. If you have a claim against the estate, then come to probate court on such and such a date and you'll be able to, to make your claim. If you don't have a will, it's called dying intestate and you have no say in what happens to your stuff in that court. People can come in, make judgment on it, whether it's a brother, sister, aunt, uncle, friend, nephew, somebody you just met at the bar last night, right? Anybody can come in and actually make a, a claim against your estate. A probate court's a very public thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a court, it's a public court. So you can go down to the, the recorder's office or wherever that, that information, the public records office, I guess, and you can actually get information on what actually went down in that courtroom. Now, just because you have a will, it does not mean it bypasses probate. So when I said you were partially right, ma'am, about if you die, it goes to probate court without a will. If you have a will, your stuff goes to probate court as well. A will does not bypass a probate court. A will is actually just a tool. I like to say it opens up probate court, or it's a little bit of say that you have from, I guess, beyond the grave, right? Um, so it's just a document that gives you a little bit of say after you've passed on. A will is a contestable document. You'll read about them all the time being contested uh, because a will itself might not even be a truly illegal document. Some people can say this is my last will and testament and write it on the back of a napkin and get it notarized and witness and it might work just fine. Or somebody might say that will is outdated. It was clearly written 20 years ago and, and me and, and whomever, the, deca the person who died is... Uh, um, we became really good friends, and he just promised me, he swore up and down that he was going to give me his car. Here's pictures of me and him in it with a thumbs up sign, okay? And if you can make a convincing case, you can override that will. You absolutely can override the will. So it's not like an end-all, be-all document by any means, okay? But it definitely helps. So if I did not have a will, and I passed, and I have a, a grown daughter, mm -hmm. So, and other relatives come to court, does she have first say? Typically, yes. The money will kind of go to next of kin. There's kind of an order that it will typically go to. Okay. But if somebody wants to be a pain or somebody really wants to challenge something, it can, it can hang up in probate for years. Really? Years, over a decade even. I mean, and some do. And along with those years of probate court comes what? Fees, right, exactly right, costs. The, the lawyer and his, uh, the, the, the judge and, and his or her golfing buddy, right, who is the lawyer, comes in and then takes fees and it just dwindles down your estate. I have plenty of stories of people that have decently sized estates that, you know, I, I have one in, in particular from somebody that I work with, her, her, their aunt died and there's a particular rocking horse that's worth quite a bit of money actually, um, but it is being um, fought over and just fought over and fought over and fought over. There's no will in place and the court's been open for years and the estate's just being dwindled down as we speak. So typically, um, if you have an easy family situation and you don't think you're going to have, you know, relatives or even anybody come out and, and fight and argue for your stuff, probate court's not the end of the world. You might have a will that says, look, I'm leaving everything to, in your case, like you said, I leave everything that I have to my daughter. 
um, you have a good relationship, it's going to be hard for somebody to come in and say, oh, Lisa said she wanted to give me her car, even though it's clearly it's laid out in the will that she doesn't want it. But it can be done. Okay, it can be done. Um, that's kind of the, the thought process there. And if you don't have one, again, your daughter in this case, if it's your only daughter, probably has a little stronger leg to stand on than Cousin Eddie, but Cousin Eddie still has a leg to stand on. So, but there's three real parts to a will, ultimately. One is just what happens to your stuff when you die. And we'll talk about how to bypass probate and all that stuff in just a minute, okay? But there's three parts to a will. One, one part has to do with what, when you die, what happens to your stuff, what happens to everything left over, whether it's your house, car, phone, bank accounts, boat, whatever it is, right? The other two parts are, are what we refer to as your powers of attorney, essentially, your living will. Okay, and there's the uh, part of part of that is what happens to your stuff when you die. I'm sorry, <laughs> I got distracted by my man coming in here. Uh, the uh, the the second parts of that are your powers of attorney for your medical directives. Do you want the the life prolonging procedures happen to you? Do you want the plug pulled? What do you want to have happen to you? Okay, that's your say. That's your power of attorney you can name, and also your power of attorney for like your finances, meaning. Who can have access to your bank accounts? Who can write checks on your behalf? Who can uh, make financial decisions based on your behalf? Okay, those are two very, very important things. If you don't have those, good luck getting anything done, or good luck having your wishes even carried out. Okay, because if your wishes aren't carried out, or like I think with Maria Shriver, does anybody remember that case back in the day where she had the the feeding tube and she was on? Uh, a ventilator and all that and it was a big national news and it basically came down she didn't have a will she was incapacitated her parents or her husband somebody said I she wants she wants life prolonging procedure we should keep feeding her and the her husband or the parents whichever one didn't say the one thing uh, said no she 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 told me she wanted to the plug pole that should be over and what happened it was a huge national case there's lawyers involved on both sides and it got you know really really ugly and it made national news all that could have been avoided really really easily okay so those three parts are very important it's important for everybody to have one no matter where you're at in your life especially for those powers of attorneys but especially if you have kids okay because you can name guardianship in your will for your kids and that's going to be pretty important as well and the reason why that's going to be important as well because if you don't typically a judge not always but typically a money will go in your estate planning wherever the kids go so maybe you wanted um, a brother sibling in-law parents whomever to watch your children after you have passed on if you if you if you die early but um, you know you have a significant amount of money or some money saved up that might be going somewhere else well again people can come out of the woodwork and cousin Eddie can say look I I uh, had a really good talk with them and they wanted me to be the guardians of the children but not really they just want the half a million dollars that you have stashed or whatever it is right so it's very important if you have uh, children with guardianship, say you are with the father or the mother of the child and you say, I want my children to be raised by my parents or whomever, can they, the other parent, come in and say or overrule what you have in your will? It can be done. Again, a will is not like an ironclad uh, document that will prevent that from happening. So if you want that to happen, it's best to get lawyers and stuff involved on the front end before that rather than just using a simple will. Uh, I mean, it's going to be tough, but it, it can be done. Okay. Any other questions so far on this, this whole will thing? So again, all this is is just a, a tool, right? So when I ask somebody, you know, I come into my office or I'm sitting with them and I say, what's your estate plan? And they say, I got a will. So, okay, so your estate plan is a piece of paper, <laughs> right? A will is not a plan. A will is just a tool. Okay. It can be used as part of an overarching plan, a plan that I want my stuff to go through probate quickly or whatever it is, but it does not bypass probate. And really, it's just a little bit of help uh, for you uh, when you can't really speak for yourself anymore, I guess, right? So on this next page, bypassing probate might be important to you. Again, probate is not the end of the world. If you have an easy situation, if you're splitting all your stuff up amongst your two or three children equally, if everything has beneficiaries on it and there's not much left over, it might be a very quick and seamless process. 
but everything you have, you're really going to want to tag a beneficiary on because a beneficiary on any of your stuff is actually going to bypass probate altogether and it's going to supersede a will or anything else. So you might have a, a bank account or a car or a house or whatever it is and you might say, in my will, I leave this bank account, car, and house to XYZ. Um, so anything you can, you can put beneficiaries on. So this includes your uh, bank account. That's good. Thank you. Um, and that includes your, your bank accounts, um, uh, you know, IRAs, 401ks, employer-sponsored plans, life insurance policies, etc. What you really need to do is put beneficiaries on everything you can. And put actual human beings and how you want it split up. Don't just put your estate. Because what you do all of a sudden when you leave something as a, as a beneficiary as your estate, which happens all the time, especially in the financial realm, when we're dealing with financial planners and other people because maybe they're trying to push a product through or get you to sign money over real quick or sell you something and they go, oh, we'll worry about the beneficiaries later. We'll just put a state for now. And it happens all the time, all the time. And um, I'm seeing here in the, the head, head shake, right? And then all that does is it just makes something that was not subject to probate all of a sudden subject to probate, <laughs> right? Because now it's going to your estate and then now it's, it's just subject to uh, the claims just like anything else is. So name individuals who are your beneficiaries. Do a beneficiary audit on your stuff every single year. I, you know, just take a quick snapshot. It doesn't take long. You'd be surprised at how many people have their ex-spouse as the beneficiary of their life insurance policy or, uh, you know, an ex-daughter-in-law or son-in-law as a, uh, a beneficiary of a life insurance policy or any other account. Or um, you have grandkids, okay? New grandkids come in and they're effectively disinherited because you didn't update your beneficiaries before you died, right? Mm -hmm. So think about that. Every time you have a life-changing event, Think about your beneficiaries, okay? It's a beneficiary audit. Hopefully the financial gurus in your life are helping you through this. Um, different things like transferable on death, payable on death, TOD and POD. That's the title you put on things like bank accounts and uh, brokerage accounts and investments and things like that. That means when you die, it transfers to that person you have named or it's payable to that person that you have named that also bypasses probate. You can put a beneficiary deed on your house. All that is is just a deed that says when I die, the ownership of this house transfers over from person A to person B. <coughs> Again, bypasses probate. It supersedes all that, supersedes a will, supersedes a trust, supersedes everything. Um, uh, any other questions on that? You said that's good for bank accounts? And yeah, you can get a, a payable on death on a bank account if you want, or transferable on death. I always forget which one's which, but it's either a TOD or a POD. So how does that work if it's a joint account? So typically joint accounts will just go to the other person on the account. Okay. Yeah. So that happens a lot of the case in like husband and wife or something like that. Any other questions on that? Kind of building? Okay. Um, that's more or less saying uh, it depends it depends on the law in which the state that which you die in and how that's all taken into consideration so if it does become community property kind of like a joint account it may um, go to the other people the community and you just completely become disinherited or it might go to your next of kin naturally. Again, it just depends on the, the state. Long story short, you want to avoid all the, the clear, you know, the gray areas that you possibly can by just naming your stuff, titling stuff, right? Yeah, that's what we tell them now, and they continue to put a trust in that state, and it makes it it's so hard for the beneficiary, the beneficiary Terrible. under the state of the trust. Mm -hmm. It's so, almost like they're controlling their money from their grave. Right. Exactly right. So if you want to control your money from beyond the grave, can you do stuff like that? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the trust. Okay, so on that next page, to trust or not to trust. A lot of the times I hear this as well. What's your estate plan? I have a trust. I'm good. Okay. All a trust is is again a piece of paper. It creates a legal entity out of thin air, essentially. All right. That's all it does. But a trust isn't an end-all, be-all document. It can be very helpful for you. 
some folks say all the time, oh, you got to be rich to have a trust. That's not true, okay? <laughs> not at all. A trust is something that's going to completely bypass probate after you die. And there's two real, I mean, there's tons of different types of trust, but the two main types are revocable and irrevocable. And they pretty much mean what they mean, right? A revocable trust means you can put stuff in and out of it. You can change it. An irrevocable trust, once it's in, it's in. Right? It's going to be very, very hard to, to change that once it's in. So for most of us, okay, in general, general terms here, obviously there's an exception to every single rule. And there's a bunch of exceptions to every single rule. But for the most part, um, all of us, if we create a trust, you're going to call, create something called a living trust. It's going to be revocable. Meaning you can title stuff in it, you can move stuff in and out of it, you can put your house in it, cars, uh, certain accounts, all right? Um, but uh, when you die, when the grantor, the creator of the trust dies, typically they then become irrevocable. So everything that's in that trust now has to be paid out in accordance with the trust document legally. And you can write things very, very specifically in this trust now. You can say, uh, you know, I want to leave $10,000 to my niece, but only if she goes to Notre Dame and becomes a nun. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can do that. Yep. And, and it has to legality come out that way. You can write that in a will, but good luck. <laughs> All right? Yeah, that doesn't not, might not necessarily happen. In a trust, it can and will happen. A trust is very private, unlike a probate court where everything is public record. A trust is completely private, and if you're not naming that trust, good luck figuring out anything that's in it. I have, I have been in some scenarios and some stories before where we have tried to figure out what's in somebody's trust, and somebody in particular I'm thinking of, and her sister had died, and they were really close, and she thought for sure she was going to get some money. She knew she had a trust. I think she even took her to get the trust. And... Um, we called and said, hey, you know, we haven't heard anything. And, and the lawyer said, it's none of your business and hung up on us. Yeah, so it is a very uh, private thing. Okay. But again, all it is is just a document that creates an entity, legal entity out of thin air, kind of. So here's the, here's the thing. When you have a revocable trust and it's a living trust and you're the grantor of it, for the most part, I mean, this isn't completely accurate, but for the most part, there's no difference between you and the trust, right? It's you pay your taxes just as if you still own the asset. You can make the decisions. You control everything. Nothing's really different. When it becomes irrevocable, that trust now is a separate, completely separate entity, and completely separate entities have to do what? Pay taxes. Okay, so now the trust has to file a tax return. The trust has to pay taxes on any income it makes and does not distribute. It can distribute taxes or, or money out. But the fact that it has to pay taxes now, it has to pay taxes at the trust tax rate. And I don't know if you've seen the trust tax rates, but don't quote me on the exact number, but I believe the new number is anything above like $12,500 of income in a trust is taxed at 40% or real close to it. The new tax law may have changed a little bit, but it's right around there. So, they, so basically, people put funds on a trust, so the IRS and the IRS get the majority of the money. All the time, yeah. So they here, so here's the big here's the big thing to know on that specific thing that I just said. Qualified money, deferred compensation. So when I say qualified money, I'm talking about IRAs, 401ks, 457s, any of that type of money that's qualified by the federal government, one way or the other. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, too, a little bit more. But a trust, you can't put those things into a trust while you're alive, okay? So your trust can't own your IRA. So that where when you die and you leave that IRA to a trust, the trust has a very hard time receiving and owning that IRA. And because it has a hard time doing that, it essentially has to be cashed out, unless you set it up just right. And it can, but it has to be set up just right. And a majority of the time when we go to a lawyer and say, oh, I need a trust, <laughs> and they do a generic trust, and it's not set up right to do that. You have to really ask for that and have it specifically set up that way. Because if it cashes it out, and now you, you, know, you, you leave a $50,000 IRA that you could have paid 12% taxes on while you were alive, and you leave it to a trust, and it cashes it out, and it doesn't distribute it, now it's paying 40% on that money when it doesn't have to, and you just lost a lot. That's all that is, right? At the end of the day, it's an it's a, it's a entity that can really help you 
take care of your assets uh, after you die, but you have to understand the tax ramifications of everything and, and utilizing a trust. It's, it's vitally important. Uh, there's other types of trusts out there. There's Medicaid trusts, there's special needs trusts, there's all types of things. But one thing I do want to say about a special needs trust is these can be really important if you are leaving money to somebody that has special needs because if they inherit that money and the asset becomes theirs, it could actually kick them out of you know, state-sponsored government benefits or Medicare or whatever it is what they, what they are receiving and you don't want to have that happen if you don't have to. So uh, special needs trusts can be uh, pretty powerful in doing that and they can inherit money, even IRA money, a little bit easier. And a lot of them disclaim the funds to the next of kin. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because of taxes and they don't want to be... Exactly. Because I'm like, why are they just spending right. this money? But right. Like you said, I guess they're... Right, so special needs trusts can, uh, can help that, all right? So any questions on trusts and, and how they work or anything like that? One last question. The irrevocable trust you said is not as flexible and it has to be dissolved? Well, the irrevocable trust is once it's in, it's in, oh, right? Okay. So if you're like, oh, I'm going to put my house in this irrevocable trust, well, you're, you're basically that's it. You can't be like, oh, I'm just kidding, oh, okay. a, a year later and take it out. Oh, okay. Right. It's, it, once it's in, it's in. It has to pay taxes. It has to do everything just like it's its own entity at that okay. point. So I'm, I get a little confused with the revocable and irrevocable because is it both as long as the trust is still living? A revocable trust will become an irrevocable trust after the creator dies every single time. Oh, okay. For most of us, you're never going to deal with an irrevocable trust ever. Okay. Yeah, it's it's mostly for special ta uh, tax and estate planning tools used for uh, very specific situations. Okay. But most of us just have living trusts, and there's really no difference between the living trust and us while we're alive. Okay. okay. You pay taxes. It doesn't file a tax return. It's all good. That's what happens when you die, because once you die, then everything it become the trust becomes irrevocable, and the trust has to pay out exactly because there's nobody left to change it. Right? You're the grantor of the trust. So, but there are special types of charitable remainder trust, charitable remainder trusts, and some other things out there that are irrevocable that you can create while you're alive. Yeah, I have seen. Okay, that's why I was confused because I have, I see those at work, and I'm like, what are these? We don't yeah. really deal with them, but we see them. Yeah. Where do you work at? Wells Fargo. Okay. Yeah. I think I said that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on. <laughs> uh, um, so the last couple slides are kind of you know one and the same. Basically, we're just talking about taxes now, right? So we've talked about uh, managing our you know wills and probate and and things like that and um, trusts and, and the tools that we have available to us. Learning about the taxation of assets and passing assets on, effic assets on effic efficiently, whew, say that five times fast, um, is, is really, really important because this is one of the things that we can actually control a little bit is our, our finances or our, is our taxes, right? And right now we're in the lowest income tax environment that we've ever been in or one of them, not quite the lowest, but one of the lowest we've ever been in. And it's only temporary and we know that taxes are actually going up in the future, okay? Basically, when it comes to, to death and estate taxes, there's various levels of taxation. The first and the foremost, the thing that everybody first refers to is the estate tax, right? What is the estate tax? What does that mean? Basically, all the estate tax does, and today it's like 10 million bucks, okay? But it says anything, the, the, the government takes a snapshot of everything that you own when you die, everything. Life insurance policies, cars, memorabilia, <laughs> okay, everything that you have. And as of right now, everything that you have that's over $10 million, they just take like 40% of it, okay, the, of the, that dollar value. So, um, and that's right now, that's today. Now this, this estate tax, this level or this exemption, quote unquote exemption of $10 million is um, um, a political football. It's been as low as in the $600,000 before, meaning that anything over $600,000 can be taxed at that, at that rate. And it moves all the time. It, just, it moves with the administration, you know? And if, if our administration changes, there's a good chance that's going to change, and vice versa. 
Uh, the other thing is every state might have an estate tax as well. Okay, so whatever state you're planning on dying in, uh, whatever you're living in when you die, you need to be aware of those state laws when it comes to estate tax. Because while the federal level might be $10 million exempted, the state level might be much, much less. Okay, and you need to be aware of that. And if you are aware of that, there are things you can do with AB trusts and spousal trusts and things like that to double exemptions and some unique estate planning tools you can use. I'm not going to really go into them because that's more advanced planning type stuff, but just know if that's a situation that you might find yourself in, there are ways around it. Okay? And, and you can always reach out and we can talk about exactly what those are. But um, that's just the estate tax. You know, most people think that $10 million, like I say, is never going to affect me, but maybe it won't drop down again. We don't know. We just have to always be aware of it. I have some, there, I mean, there's some interesting stories. I know, I know a guy who has a 12, I know, I know the guy, I know the guy who knows the guy. I know somebody that's got a, is selling a $3 million violin, okay? It's a violin worth $3 million. And they're selling it to somebody who is, uh, has a $12 million violin that they are getting rid of to buy this $3 million violin, okay? <laughs> interesting, right? Yeah, very interesting. Anyway, so say you inherit that $12 million violin, okay? Through no fault of your own, maybe it's a family heirloom or something like that, and you inherit this $12 million violin, well, you have to pay $800,000 in taxes on that. And so unless you have $800,000 of taxes on that, guess what has to happen to the violin, right? So even if, yeah, sold, right? So uh, it can get interesting when you start working with some properties and, and things like that, like that rocking horse I talked about earlier. It gets really interesting when stuff like that happens. But just be aware of that. Be aware of the state and, and, the, and all that stuff. What's but the taxes on the rocking horse? <laughs> the, the, well, the, that's in probate, so that's just getting tacked. And then whenever it does change hands, there'll probably be a state tax on it. <laughs> on top of that. Um, so then you have like, so that's just that, okay? That's just the estate tax. Then you have income tax. If money has never had income tax paid on it, income tax is due. And this is mostly when it comes to qualified money, okay? When I say qualified money, I'm talking about uh, IRAs, 401ks, 457s, no matter where you work, okay? And I'm going to talk about this little qualified thing real quick. I won't spend too much time on it because this is more of a big tax planning thing than an estate planning thing, but it is important. Okay, there's two ways that money we have is qualified. And with qualified money, I'm talking like IRA, 401k, you know, 457, SEP IRA, okay? Really anything that has a letter or a number behind it is some sort of qualified plan. And for the most part, uh, they come in two forms. They come in either traditional or they come in Roth. Okay, and they mean two very different things. If I have a traditional account, and say I have $10,000, okay, and that's all I make in a year is 10,000 bucks, I can save all $10,000 of that in my, you know, employ 401k or anything in the traditional pot of money because I don't have to pay taxes on that. Right? Um, that's that's tax-free tax, tax -free money. Or not tax-free money. I get deducted out of my taxes. So my taxes say that I made zero dollars even though I saved it. Government's essentially uh, incentivizing you to save a little bit of money by not paying taxes. Now, that money grows. It grows to $20,000, hopefully, right? Knock on wood. And now I need that money. I'm going to access that money. I'm going to take all that $20,000 out. I'm going to buy a Subaru Outback or whatever I'm going to do with it, right? I don't get all twenty thousand dollars, right? Because remember, I didn't pay any taxes on it yet. I have to pay taxes on all of it now, everything that I take out. So, say I'm in a, the twenty-five percent, twenty-five percent tax rate. Well, that's five thousand dollars. I only get fifteen thousand bucks. Okay, pretty pretty self-explanatory how traditional money works. This is ordinary income, whatever ordinary income tax bracket you're in. There's no special tax treatment to that. The other the other type of piece is a Roth, okay? And Roth, if I can't get a tax deduction on it, I have to pay taxes today, right? So my 25% of $10,000 is only $2,500. So I pay my taxes today on that money. So I can only invest 7,500 bucks. 
that 7,500 bucks goes over the same investment over the same time and it doubles. Okay? It doubles to 15. Now when I take that 15 out, how much do I have to pay in taxes on this 15? Uh, Nothing, right? You already paid. So you got away with paying $2,500 to the federal government versus $5,000 to the federal government. You actually pay less to the federal government, but your money didn't grow as high. But here's the secret. If you're in this, if this tax bracket is the exact same when you put the money in that you take the money out as, it makes no difference whether you decide to do traditional or Roth. Okay? But this is a big variable right here. This is a variable that moves a lot. This is a variable that we know right now is temporary and is going to change after 2025. That's not what the law says. Okay? If this goes up in the future, we really hurt ourselves because we had an opportunity to pay this taxes and now we're, we're going to net less than $15,000. If it goes down, we really helped ourselves. How many people think this is going to go down in the future? <laughs> yeah, not many, right? Um, but here's the interesting thing. So here comes the interesting thing of, of, of a lot of this qualified money and it is, one, when we're 70 and a half years old, okay, now we have to take money out of this account whether we want to or we don't. And that's a taxable event and now we're paying taxes on that money. But more importantly, when we die, that money goes to the next generation and it's never had taxes paid on it. So guess who has to pay the taxes on that money? the beneficiary that's right it can be inherited it can be potentially inherited stretched over the course of their life and they have to take something called the required minimum distribution from it okay so they might need to take three four five six seven eight percent of that money out every single year depending on how old they are or they might just get it all at once so if you have a two hundred thousand dollars and this comes to you all at once all of a sudden what happens to your tax bracket right it goes way up and all of a sudden money, you had an opportunity to pay 25 or more realistically now 12, okay, um, might get taxed at 40%. Or remember back to the trust and not, uh, trust having a really hard time inheriting IRAs, leaving all that to a trust, you leave mostly no choice unless the trust is set up very specifically and correctly, okay. But generic trust is probably most of the time not going to be set up right. So, all of a sudden, this happened to my, my grandma, actually. She had like 70,000 bucks she left to my sister, or my, my sister, my mom, my, and her two sisters. And uh, she left it in the trust and, you know, had to distribute all that money right away. My, they, no one, none of the sisters needed that money, but they had to take it basically all at once and get it taxed on it all at once. And it hurt their tax bracket. Okay. So very important concept to understand with all this traditional money, how it passes on to the next generation. And everything that we're doing in our estate planning, our financial planning and everything is trying to limit this burden as much as possible. Okay, uh, uh, really, really important. Roth, on the other hand, this money goes to the next generation completely tax free. They don't have to pay taxes on it either. They do have to take some of it out, but they don't have to pay taxes on it. Okay. Um, other types of money that there is are uh, something called, uh, what else do I have here? Taxes on insurance, okay? So if you have life insurance, the entire benefit of life insurance usually will go to the next generation completely tax-free as well. They'll just get a check. They don't have to pay a single nickel of taxes on it. It might be open up to some estate tax issues, but that's only if we start getting above that $10 million currently. So for the most part, life insurance is completely tax-free as well as it goes on to the next generation. Perhaps one of the most um, beneficial things that the, the IRS has in, in line for us is this thing called stepped-up basis. So stepped-up basis means that if I own a house or an asset that's non-qualified, okay, um, a stock, okay, so say I bought a, a stock of Amazon for a dollar, okay, I probably wouldn't be here right now for one, okay, and it grows to 2K like it is now, all right, <clears throat> um, and I said, oh, I want to sell that stock and I want to take that money. I'd have to pay tax on, you know, $1,999 of this, okay. If I died and I just left that stock that I own to somebody, you know, relative or whomever, kid, they inherit it at the fair market value of the date of death. So if they get it at $2,000, that becomes their basis in it. 
So if they sell it for $2,000, they don't have to pay tax on any of that. So nobody essentially ever pay tax on this gain. If they sell it for $3,000, they'd pay tax on $1,000. If, if they sold it for $1,000, they'd actually take a loss of $1,000 on that stock because it's inherited at the value in which it is a day of your debt. So that's the same with, you know, a lot of stocks are a big one, property is a big one, your house is a big one. If I have a $200,000 house that I paid for 30 years ago for $50,000 and I die, you know, my kids can inherit it at $200,000. Nobody has to pay tax on that gain. And then they sell it, they pay realtors, they get it fixed up, they pay selling costs. They can be at $175,000 for that house after all that. That's a loss, right? It's a loss. So um, I don't know if that's going to be around forever. I think it's just too favorable for us in the IRS, <laughs> in my opinion. But I don't know. Maybe it will be. Okay. Um, so we talked about non-qualified assets, go, assets going with stepped-up basis. We talked about qualified money and how it works with required minimum distributions and, and understanding kind of blowing up the tax brackets. Um, we talked about insurance and how that is is taken. So, I mean, you can really think about it when you're passing assets on, however you're earning interest, that's or earning interest, however you're paying taxes on it, that's how the next generation is going to get taxed. There's one other thing that happens with estate tax sometimes. Uh, what we see, there's two more quick things I'll hit on and we'll pretty much be done, okay? Um, one of them is gifting. A lot of times we, we, we can gift $15,000, $15,000 now, $15, $15, I think, uh, to the next to a kid or, or anybody. I can give everybody in this room $15,000, and there's no tax ramifications of that. All right? But people think that if I give more than $15,000, there's a tax ramification to that. That is not the case. Okay? I could give each one of you $100,000 in this room, if I physically had $100,000 to give each one of you, and there would be no tax ramifications of any of that. On either end, yeah. I already paid taxes on the money, right? If I just took money out of my wallet and gave to you, I already paid taxes on that money. What that $15,000 is, is just an exemption of a lifetime maximum of five million bucks. So if I gave you $5 million, you know, I'd, the first $15,000 of that would be exempted from that $5 million maximum. Anything else would go towards the $5 million maximum. That's really hard to say, and that was really confusing. But long story short, okay, if you give more than $5 million away as a gift over the course of your lifetime, then there's going to be some tax implications. Okay, The $15,000 that you can give away is just an exemption from that overall $5 million. Okay, So that's how that works. So that, that's really important to know because a lot of people, when it starts coming to getting sucked to their heirs without any tax, uh, Medicare or Medicaid planning and things like that, that can become uh, pretty powerful to do in the right way. And with that being said, the Medicaid planning, that's the other one that can wipe, long-term care is a really big thing that can wipe out your estate if you're not properly planning for it. It's probably the single thing that is most misunderstood and more poorly planned for from people of all different uh, uh, financial backgrounds. but. Medicaid is essentially the, the government paying for your long-term care. And so what people will say is, I'm going to give all my assets away to my kids and my family and friends and whatever, and then I'm just going to go pay Medicaid, and that way they can at least inherit something. They're not going to take, they're not going to take all my money before I, I die. Well, there's a look-back period in order to do that, okay, and it's five years. So if I gave $100,000 or $500,000 or whatever it is away, and then I go into long-term care the next day, they're going to count those assets I gave away as, as, as buying, essentially. Okay, so there's a five-year period. You have to do the planning for that. You can use trusts and things like that in order to, to st stash that money. But don't think you're just going to give all your money away and go and get paid on the government's dime for long-term care. There's going to be a look-back period, and they're going to take those assets back, and then they'll then you can get on there. So. Uh, something important to note. Mm, that's a little confusing. Can you? I don't know. I'm confused on it. So why would they do the Medicaid planning? You said like why? What, what's the point? Because it will say 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 you know it's eight it's it's say it's ten grand a month right now for long term care, which is pretty reasonable, right? So that's a hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. 
okay? So say I'm about to go into a long-term care facility and uh, I can't, I can't afford, I don't, and all I have is 100 grand or all I have is 120 grand, but I want to give that to my kid or my niece or whomever. Um, well, I will say, well, I'll give them to it now and then I'll say, I don't have money to pay for it and the government will pay it for me. Oh, right? They don't let you do that. They say, oh, I saw that you just gave $120,000 to your kid two weeks ago. Oh, okay. You need to, that money is going to be used to pay for this before, before we pay for you. So you so can't skirt it. Five years and okay. Then yeah, then then it starts being okay. okay. So um, yeah, guys. I mean, all these things, like I say, it's just tools. But in our overall financial plan, we really have to look at how do I keep my money, right? How do I plan in case uh, of one of two things usually happens: I, I die too soon, <laughs> all right, or I die too late, meaning I run out of money because I live too long, <laughs> which is a very real thing, especially when it comes to long-term care and stuff like that. How do I play the tax game properly? How do I set everything up to go efficiently as possible? Keep more of my money for my retirement. Don't worry about, or, or, or keep my money for my life and, and, and pass it on as efficiently as possible. And that's estate planning. These tools are available to help you. Hopefully today was helpful for you and give you at least the right questions to ask uh, about your own planning. Um, and uh, that's it. If you have any questions or concerns, obviously let, let me know. We're here to help.